Hello, in this lecture we'll study composite functions and inverses of functions. Specifically, for composite functions we'll learn what they are, how to find and evaluate them, and for inverse functions similarly, what are they and how to find them. Also, for inverse functions specifically, we'll investigate graphical properties of how an inverse function relates to the original function. So, suppose you have two functions, f of x and g of x. There are many different ways we could combine them to make new functions. For example, if f of x is x squared plus 1 and g of x is 3x minus 4, then we could add them to get x squared plus 1 plus 3x minus 4, which simplifies as x squared plus 3x minus 3. Note that this is now a new function we formed out of f and g. We could also take the difference, f of x minus g of x, which simplifies as x squared minus 3x plus 5. We could take the product x squared plus 1 times 3x minus 4, in which case this would expand to be 3x cubed minus 4x squared plus 3x minus 4. Another way to get a new function out of the originals f and g, we multiplied them. And we could take the quotient f of x over g of x, x squared plus 1 over 3x minus 4. But there's another thing we could do with two functions. We can take a composition. What you do to take a composition of functions is plug one function into the other one. So suppose f of x is minus 4x plus 3 and g of x is x minus 7. To evaluate a function at a number, what do you do? You plug in the number in place of the variable. For example, f of 6. Well, f of x is minus 4x plus 3. So f of 6 is negative 4 times 6 plus 3, negative 24 plus 3, or simply negative 21. That's how we evaluated f of 6. And you can do the same steps if you're evaluating the function f of x, not just at a number, at something more complicated. For example, what about f of x minus 7? Well, the original function f of x simply says, whatever x is, take negative 4 times it plus 3. So whatever you are plugging into the function, multiply it by negative 4 and add 3. But now we're not just plugging in x, we're plugging in x minus 7. But you do the same things. You take whatever you're plugging in, which here is x minus 7 and not just x, but whatever you plug in gets multiplied by negative 4 and then add 3. But now we have negative 4 times the quantity x minus 7 plus 3. So we can distribute that negative 4 and collect like terms to see that f of x minus 7 is just negative 4x plus 31. But observe, g of x at the beginning was x minus 7. So here we have f of x minus 7. In other words, we can do f of g of x. f of g of x is simply f of x minus 7 because that's what g of x is. It's x minus 7. And we already know that this simplifies down to negative 4x plus 31. So we took g of x, one function, and plugged it into another function. This is a composition of functions. The notation for a composition of functions, you can either write on the right-hand side, take g of x and plug it into f, or you can use this notation here, an open circle. And you read it as f of g of x. You can also say f composed with g of x or less commonly the composite function of f with g. For example, suppose f of x is x squared plus x, and g of x is x cubed plus 5, and h of x is negative 2x plus 3. We can find all of the following composite functions. f of g of x, g of f of x, h of h of x. There's no reason you cannot compose a function with itself. So for part a, f of g of x simply means we're going to take g of x and plug it in to f. Now remember that g of x was given to be x cubed plus 5. So if we're going to take g of x and plug it into f, we're going to plug x cubed plus 5 into f. Now, what does f do? Whatever the input is, the input gets squared, and then you add the original input. So f of a thing is the thing squared plus the original thing. So what is f of x cubed plus 5? It's that input squared plus that input. So we have x cubed plus 5 squared plus x cubed plus 5. f of a thing is thing squared plus thing. f of a thing is thing squared plus thing. So now all we have to do is simplify this down. If you expand out x cubed plus 5 squared, you get x to the sixth plus 10x cubed plus 25, and then we simply have an x cubed plus 5 hanging around, so we collect like terms.
x to the sixth plus 11x cubed plus 30. That's f of g of x. Moving on to the second example, what is g of f? So this is read g of f of x, and it means we're going to take f of x and plug it in to g. What was f of x? It was x squared plus x. So for f of x, we're going to say g of x squared plus x. Now g says whatever your input is, take your input and cube it, and then add 5. So g of a thing is thing cubed plus 5. So g of a thing is thing cubed plus 5. All we have to do is simplify this down. It takes a little bit of work, but x squared plus x, all cubed, is x to the 6th plus 3x to the 5th plus 3x to the 4th plus x cubed. And we also have that plus 5 hanging off on the right, and there's no simplification to be done here. What about the third, h of h of x? So we're going to take h of x and plug it into itself. So h of x at the top is given to be negative 2x plus 3. So h says whatever your input is, multiply it by negative 2 and then add 3. So now the input isn't just x, it's 9, minus 2x plus 3. So take that, multiply it by minus 2, and then add 3. Distribute the minus 2, collect like terms, and you get 4x minus 3. A different sort of example. Now we want to find functions f and g so that the given function h is the composition of f of g of x. So we're going to find functions f and g so that f of g of x is 3x minus 4 to the 4th minus 6 x plus 1 squared plus 7 times x plus 1, or minus 2 thirds times the quantity 5x squared minus 11 over 4 all cubed plus 1 over 8. Now in each part, multiple answers are correct and possible. In fact, infinitely many different answers are correct and possible. There is, in each case, I'd say a kind of implied most obvious answer, but it's by no means the only correct answer. So here, h of x is something to the fourth. It's 3x minus 4 to the fourth. So if we took 3x minus 4 and plugged it into the function that says raise everything to the fourth power, we would say take this and then raise it to the fourth power, and that's exactly what h of x is. Here, in the second example, h of x is negative 6 times a thing squared plus 7 times exactly the same thing. So we might take negative 6 times input squared plus 7 times input, and then what do we input? Not just x, but x plus 1. So if we took x plus 1 and substituted it in for x in this expression, we'd get exactly h. So f of g of x will be exactly h. So now look at the third example, negative 2 thirds times something cubed plus 1 over 8, where the something is a more complicated expression. Now what you can do is you can say, suppose f of x is the minus 2 thirds times something cubed plus 1 over 8, and what do you plug in? Not just x, but that inner expression of 5x squared minus 11 over 4. And again, these are not the only possible correct answers. They are, I would say, the most straightforward and obvious way to break down the original function as a composition of two things but they're not the only correct answers. So let's evaluate some composite functions. f of x is x squared plus x, and g of x is x plus 5. Now we want to find f of g of 2. In other words, you want to take the composite function f of g of x and evaluate it at x equals 2. So there are two ways you could do this. First, you could find a general expression for f of g of x and then simply plug in 2. For example, f of g of x, we're going to take g of x and plug it into f. So we're going to take x plus 5 and square it and add it to itself. So we have x plus 5 squared plus x plus 5. If you expand and collect like terms, this becomes x squared plus 11x plus 30. Now all we have to do is plug in 2 and get a net result of 56. The other thing you could do, however, we're not really asked to find f of g of x in general. If we just need to find f of g of 2, we can simply compute g of 2 and plug g of 2 into f. Specifically, g of 2. So remember that g of x is x plus 5, so g of 2 is simply 7. Now all we have to do is take that specific number and plug it into f. And what's f of 7? 
Well, f of x was x squared plus x, so this is merely 7 squared plus 7, which is 56. It's the answer we already got. Both approaches are equally valid. Uh, they both give the same correct answer. If you really only need to know one particular value, this second method is usually a little less work. But if you need to do it two or three times, you may as well find a general expression as we did in the first option and then plug in a few values. Now here's another example. We have a graph of two functions. They're labeled f of x and g of x. What we want to do is find f of g of zero and g of f of minus three. Now we don't have expressions for f and g, so we're not gonna be able to find a general expression for f of g of x. So we have to do that second option of working with specific numbers. So first, what's f of g of zero? First, we're going to compute g of zero and then plug that into f. Now, what is g of 0? It's labeled as 0, comma, minus 1, so g of 0 is minus 1. So f of g of 0 is f of minus 1. So now all we have to do is compute what is f of minus 1. And because minus 1, 1 is on the graph of f, f of minus 1 equals 1. So g of 0 is minus 1, f of minus 1 is 1, so overall f of g of 0 is 1. Now let's look at g of f of minus three. So first ask yourself, what is f of minus three? If we look at the graph for f, if you plugged in x equals minus three, what point on the graph would you get? You'd get this one right here. When x is minus three, y is three. So f of minus three is three. Now we just need to compute g of three. We're gonna take that value of three and plug it into the function g and g of three is minus 2. So f of minus 3 is 3, g of 3 is minus 2, so overall g of f of minus 3 is equal to minus 2. Now let's talk about inverse functions. Suppose f of x is a function. If g happens to be a function so that the composition f of g of x is simply x and also the composition g of f of x is simply x, then the two functions are called inverses of one another. G is the inverse of F, but observe in our red expression, the order doesn't really matter, so F is also the inverse of G. What we write is that G is F inverse. So you read this exponent of minus one in giant air quotes, it's not really an exponent, you read it as F inverse. And what we do is we say that F is an invertible function whose inverse function is G. Now the idea with this definition is that f inverse somehow undoes what f does. So for example, suppose f of x is x cubed, then the inverse function is the cube root of x. In other words, if you want to undo cubing, what would you do? You would take a cube root. This is what inverse functions do, but let's see how it plays out in terms of this composition definition. So we're just gonna check above. What is f of f inverse? Well, f inverse of f was cube root of x, so what is f of cube root? Well, our function f says take your input and cube it. So if I take the cube root of x and I cube it, we just get out x. Now let's check it in the other order. f inverse of f of x, well, f of x was x cubed. f inverse of x cubed is therefore the cube root of x cubed, which is again, just x. It didn't matter what order we did this composition, the function composed with its inverse will produce simply x. Now observe, I said earlier we called it an exponent of minus one in gigantic air quotes because it's not really an exponent. This is really unfortunate notation. Everyone agrees it's bad notation, but it's what it is and we're all used to it. Okay, so when you're talking about inverse functions, you use this exponent notation, but you do not mean one over f of x. That is not what we're doing. We're not simply taking one over f of x. The inverse function is something different. If you really wanted to write one over f of x, you can clarify that you don't mean the inverse function by putting parentheses around f of x and then putting this exponent here. And I agree, the first time you see this, it looks kind of silly. It doesn't look like it's any different. But trust me, once you get used to it, everyone recognizes that this is the inverse function and this is one over f. But honestly, 
most people would simply write this rather than this because this notation one over f of x avoids the ambiguity okay when you're talking about inverse functions you use this exponent in air quotes of minus one and therefore you don't want to use an exponent of minus one when you're actually just talking about one over so how do you find the equation for an inverse function first of all you can't always do it because not every function even has an inverse and if it does exist that doesn't mean it's actually possible to find an explicit equation for it but not all hope is lost there are a few steps you can try as a sort of general approach so step one whatever f of x is you're going to say that y is equal to f of x for example if f of x is 2x minus 1 you begin by writing y equals 2x minus 1 next you switch all of your x's and y's so we had y equals 2x minus 1 now we write x equals 2y minus 1 everywhere we had a y we replace it with an x everywhere we had an x we replace it with a y then what you do is solve this for y if you can solve that expression for y you have found f inverse so we had x equals 2y minus 1 and we want to solve it for y add 1 to both sides and divide by 2 to a solve for y y equals x plus 1 over 2. so in this example f inverse of x is x plus 1 over 2. now we can check that the inverse we got meets the definition of the inverse function we had f of x equals 2x minus 1 and we solved that f inverse of x should be x plus 1 over 2. so what do we need to check we're going to check the composition of the function and its inverse in both orders and see that in both cases we get out just an x so f of f inverse remember f of x is 2x minus 1 f inverse of x is x plus 1 over 2 so this says take f inverse and plug it into f so we have f of x plus 1 over 2 now f of x says take your input multiply by 2 and subtract 1. so take that input multiply by 2 and subtract 1 the twos cancel and then the ones cancel and you just get x now let's try the other order we're going to take f of x equals 2x minus 1 and plug it into the inverse expression now the inverse function said whatever your input is add 1 and then divide that entire thing by 2. so we take 2x minus 1 we add 1 and we divide the entire thing by 2. now the first thing is that the ones cancel and then the twos cancel and you get out just x so in both cases the composition of the function with its inverse in both orders gives out just x we have found the inverse function let's do another example suppose f of x equals x over x plus 4. let's attempt to find an inverse function so let's follow the same steps we write y equals x over x plus 4 by replacing f of x with y now everywhere we see a y we're going to replace it with an x and everywhere we see an x we're going to replace it with a y and we get x equals y over y plus 4. now what we need to do is try to solve this for y the first step is to eliminate the fraction by multiplying both sides by the denominator so x times y plus 4 equals y over y plus 4 times y plus 4. we multiplied both sides by that denominator of y plus 4 and they cancel out on the right so now we simply have x times the quantity y plus 4 equals y next let's gather all of the terms that have a y onto one side and all of the terms that don't onto the other so we distribute the left to get xy plus 4x we move all of the y's to the left and all of the non-y's to the right so this term has a y it stays this term did not move it over this term has a y move it to the left now we can factor a y out of the expression on the left so we have y times the quantity x minus 1 equals minus 4x and by dividing by that x minus 1 we have solved for y so since we were able to solve for y we conclude that the inverse function is given by f inverse of x equals negative 4x over x minus 1. so another example suppose f of x equals negative 2x minus 3 over x can we find an inverse so we run through the same steps replace f of x with y y equals negative 2x minus 3 over x now swap all of your x's with y's and y's with x's so now we have x equals minus 2y minus 3 over y now we have to solve for y the first step is to clear out the denominator so we multiply both sides by y it cancels the denominator on the right 
let's take all of the terms that have a y and move them to one side and all the terms that don't and move them to the other. Well, the only thing here is to move that minus 2y over to the left. Now we can factor a y out of the left-hand side and divide by x plus 2, and we have solved for y equals minus 3 over x plus 2. So now we conclude that f inverse of x is that expression, minus 3 over x plus 2. And if you wanted to check, what would you do? You would take this as f inverse and this function as f and check, is f of f inverse equal to x? Is f inverse of f equal to x? And in both cases, you'll find that yes, that's what happens. So here's a fact. Suppose y is equal to f of x. The graph of the inverse function takes a very specific form. It's a reflection over the line y equals x. So for example, suppose f of x is 2x minus 1. We have already found that the inverse function is x plus 1 over 2. If you break this apart, you'll get 1 half x plus 1 half, x over 2 plus 1 over 2. So here's our set of coordinate axes. Here's the line y equals x, nice big bold black line just for clarity. Now here's the original function f of x, 2x minus 1. It has a slope of 2, so it's going up and it's going up steeper than y equals x, but it has an intercept of minus 1. And here is f inverse of x. Its slope is 1 half, so it's going up but slower than that black line of y equals x, and its intercept is up a little bit from the origin, it's at plus 1 half. But this takes a very specific shape. This red of f of x, if I simply mirror image reflect it across this line, I'll get exactly the blue line for the inverse. Another example, let's take uh, the first thing we worked with, f of x equals x cubed and f inverse of x equals cube root. So here's our coordinate axes. Here's the strong line we're going to be reflecting across. Here is the graph of y equals x cubed. And here is the graph of cube root of x. And again, notice if you take the red line and you reflect it across that line of y equals x, you get the blue line and vice versa. So we have stated that if you have y equals f of x, then the inverse function is simply the reflection over the line y equals x, if that inverse exists. Now a consequence of this fact is that domain and range are related between f and f inverse. The domain of the original function f is exactly the range of the inverse function. And similarly, the range of the original function f is the domain of the inverse function. So for example, f of x equals x over x plus 4. We have already solved that the inverse function is given by minus 4x over x minus 1. Now the domain of the original function, x over x plus 4, there's nothing you can't plug in here so long as you don't divide by 0. So the domain is all x's that are not minus 4. The domain of f inverse, in contrast, the only thing you can't plug into this expression would be x equals 1, because then you would divide by 0. So the domain of f is all x's other than minus 4, and the domain of f inverse is all x's other than 1, which means the range of f is the same thing as the domain of f inverse. So it's everything except 1, but range is y coordinates, so it's all y's except 1. What that means is that this function will never output 1. You can, in fact, show that if you set this equal to 1, you'll have a big problem. That can't be solved. Similarly, f inverse, its range is the domain of the original function, everything other than minus 4. So the range of f inverse is everything other than minus 4. And if you took this function and tried to set it equal to minus 4, you would again end up with a pretty big problem. I encourage you to do it. Take the original function, set it equal to 1, and see why that cannot ever be solved. In other words, the range of f can't include 1. Similarly, take f inverse, set it equal to minus 4, and see why that can't be solved. In other words, you cannot possibly get a minus 4 out of the function f inverse. Now the horizontal line test is a visual way to look at the graph of a function to determine if there ever is an inverse to begin with. The horizontal line test says the function f is invertible if and only if there are no horizontal lines that cross the graph of f more than once. Functions that pass the horizontal line test are said to be one-to-one -one functions. So for example, 
suppose this is the graph of our function. I have no idea what equation it is, but there's its graph. Every horizontal line, if I draw a horizontal line, it will only intersect the graph once. It doesn't matter where I draw the line, it'll only intersect it at most once, assuming that this sort of general pattern continues. So since every horizontal line intersects it at most once, it passes the horizontal line test, which means this graph representing a function can be inverted. So here's the graph of f of x equals x squared. Does it pass the horizontal line test? Is it possible for a horizontal line to intersect this graph more than once? It fails the horizontal line test. If you draw any horizontal line at a height above zero, you're going to end up with two different intersections. What that means is that f of x equals x squared does not have an inverse function. This comes as a big surprise because remember, inverse functions are thought of as how do you undo something. And if I asked you, how do you undo squaring something, you'd say take a square root. That isn't quite correct. It's almost correct, but it's not completely correct. Specifically, what we have to do is restrict the domain of the original function. If I take the original graph of f of x equals x squared and I simply throw away everything corresponding to negative x's, so now I only have half of the original parabola. Now it will pass the horizontal line test. I've exactly thrown out everything that would make it fail. So this graph, this function with a restricted domain, is invertible. And its inverse function is root x. So root x is not quite the inverse function of x squared. It's the inverse function of x squared where you're only allowed to plug in non-negative numbers. And a way to think of this is, what is 3 squared? 9. What's the square root of 9? 3. I ended up back where I started, so I correctly inverted myself. I plugged in a positive number, and I squared it, and I took a square root, and I ended up where I started. So that correctly inverted. However, what if I plugged in a negative number? What's negative 3 squared? 9. What's the square root of 9? It's 3. I didn't end up where I started. I started at negative 3, and I ended up at Three. So the composition of squaring with square root only results in exactly what you started with if you restrict yourself to only dealing with non-negative numbers. So the square root function is sort of the inverse function of x squared. It's the inverse function of x squared with a restricted domain to not include negative numbers.